All right, you bunch of yahoos, strap yourselves in for another episode of Dan and Don's Toxic Masculinity. In other words, shut up, sit up, and pay attention. Here we go. Welcome back to another episode of Toxic Masculinity. Uh, normally, I would be uh, I would be introducing the other dashingly handsome mustache uh, man, Don the Predator Fry, but uh, Don is off taking care of some other type of business right here, but in in his absence, we have Tony that will be stepping on in. And because he's got facial hair, he meets the candidacy right there. So whether it be, well, he's got even more than just a mustache. He's got the goatee to go there with it. And we actually are, are even, have even more hair inside the studio right now with our guest here today, Ian McCall. And uh, we'll be talking about Ian in a, in a lot of different as aspects here for what he has done in his MMA career. Um, I mean, there, there seemed like this, uh, I was looking through Wikipedia, and just simply to see uh, a nickname of calling being called Uncle Creepy. That's definitely going to be one of those questions I'll be asking him about. But then he's also had somewhat of a, I'll say a colorful uh, checkered past, but uh, the fact that uh, he's still here and he's still moving forward and he's trying to use his life as a way to help to guide others and maybe the proper direction. And correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, sir, Ian. Well, you're 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 right on the path. That's that's my life now. I, I live a life of service um to other athletes and to obviously, you know, take care of myself, but but uh, the first person is my daughter and then my my athletes and my students at my gym and you know, I've got an amazing set of clients and people that I get to work with. My community is, um, it's still small, but it's growing. You know, I'm a scientific researcher in, in the field of psychedelics. So I use plant medicines to help people heal their brain damage. <clears throat> I have a nonprofit because I'm not an actual doctor or scientist. I just am a guy that learned a bunch of shit um, because I healed myself. And and I've been, I, I wanted to be a scientist as a kid. I was a huge dork. Uh, um, I just have it really tough. So, uh, but I, I, I started out when I retired, I wanted to kill myself. I was addicted to fentanyl. Um, you know, I had to find a way out and psychedelics was the way biohacking in general, you know, stem cells, peptides, that sort of stuff as well. I mean, anti-inflammatory diet, a lot of things that I learned from healing my daughter, she got very sick when I was uh, in, in the UFC, when I was the best in the world. She got juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and um, we used cannabis. Well, diet and exercise, massage, physical therapy, but also high dose cannabis oil when she was two. And we had her healed by the time she was probably five, I'd say. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of great things about that they're doing with cannabis that uh, you know, a lot of people think it's just you know something, to, uh, a recreational type drug, but there are so many healing properties with it. It's a uh, it's something that I've been, I'll say, involved with for about the last half a dozen years and uh, and, and learning more on an everyday basis. So it's kind of like going that that image of uh, a dude half stone out of his man smoking up a doobies right there. No, there's, there's a whole lot of other cool things that uh, cannabis will do for you, whether it's the extraction of oils or however they're taking different elements of it. It's uh, there's a lot of wonderful things. And I think we're just scratching the tip of the iceberg. But uh, I don't know if Big Pharma... Pharmaceutical companies will be happy if we do uh, come up with some nice things right there because I think most pharmaceutical companies want you to be on their monthly payment program back to them. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, uh, I've always been anti establishment. I mean, my dad smuggled cannabis around the world in the 70s. Uh, <laughs> the, the DEA was, was raiding my house. I, I'm starting to see a trend here right now. And we're only just a couple of minutes. But I'm starting to see this trend here right now. Yeah, I was I was naughty. I, I grew up part of the one percent here, very wealthy family and around people here in Orange County. But all these kids had to buy drugs somewhere, um, and you know, I just saw the opportunity. I just I don't know. I liked I always liked the that weird under sort of belly lifestyle for some strange reason growing up. Um, even though I was you know private school educated, it just these this was just my friends. I don't know. My brother and I grew up to be thugs for a while. Um, you know collecting money and stuff as well, but more or less that will stay with the drug part. Um, I knew that I started smoking when I was eight years old and cannabis has never done me wrong. You really? Know? You started smoking cannabis at eight? Yeah, that's not appropriate. I'm not saying anyone should do that. Okay. But, you know, when I had to get high with my daughter when she was two years old, 
it, it was kind of funny, but kind of not, you know, but I knew that to get her off of methotrexate, which is a chemotherapy drug, I made her through her hair thin. Her hair is just now back to being what it should be. Um, and she has beautiful hair. Um, they, I got her off painkillers and anti-inflammatories, a fucking two-year-old, you know, uh, I saw them hit my daughter with ketamine, trying to drain her legs, like really, in, really traumatic shit that she went through. And and the, the thing was, is her, it was my, my fault and her mother's fault for stressing her out so bad that we made her sick. Um, so I, I, I went really deep on how to heal a person. Cause that's my baby girl. She's all I have. Um, you know, she's everything that I have. I, you know, I, I spend as much time with her as possible. Um, and so do you I, have, again, just that, uh, do you have sole custody of her or do you have shared custody or her mom and I split her? The thing is, is okay. Her mother has, is, you know, has a, a husband and two new babies and takes her to school every day. And dad is a world traveling, um, you know, drug researcher. <laughs> I'll go spend time in the jungle. I'll, I go, I talk at all kinds of conferences and stuff. And um, so, you know, I, I, whenever I'm home, I'm, I make sure to spend as much time with her as possible. Like I was just traveling 10 out of 12 weeks so 10 different time zones and back in 12 weeks um, doing what I do. So, um, when I when I went down the path of of not trying to kill myself anymore or not thinking about it, you know, I I knew I had to drop the inflammation in my body. I had to get off of the opiates or fentanyl. Um, so I injected myself with a bunch of peptides. But the the psychedelic is what made me click. My brother gave me a DMT trip, um, and it was like it's time to grow up, Peter Pan, Count Chocula. You know, you you have to fucking your your fighting days are over. You're not going to be the best. You're not the best in the world anymore. We have to stop this. We have brain damage. We're this addicted. Um, we're not happy. You know, this is a, we're in a really bad place. So I went down the road and I kept microdosing. And as I microdosed, I learned I was finally open to understanding something outside of violence. Can, can you explain just to people what a microdose is? Microdose is the actual the actual definition of microdose is something you're not supposed to feel. It's supposed to be sub perceptual. So you're not supposed to perceive a microdose, but the human condition likes to be high. That's just how people like to operate. A little bit of a buzz, whether that's caffeine, cannabis, alcohol, uh, fucking cocaine, I don't know. Whatever people like, people like a buzz. Um, this is a, a very uh, healthy buzz because you're actually, if you microdose over multiple days, you're having your body produce um, these peptides like brain-derived neurotrophic factor, glutamate. These are miracle growth for the brain. So... As this process happens, um, for me at least, I, I saw my my peers, the people that I'm friends with now, like these amazing researchers, their protocol was like one day on, two days off, two days on, three days off. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm trying not to fucking shoot myself here. Um, so I would go five days on, two days off. You know, I and then I saw the healing potential and I went deeper. And I've been told I'm on the spectrum, um, which kind of makes sense. Um, I was 36 when I found out and I laughed it off and I was like, cool, okay. Um, but when I get obs when you get obsessed with things with, with this, whatever, you know, being on the spectrum, we get very hyper obsessed with things. The last time I did that, I became the best in the world at fighting. Um, you know, it was a very selfish thing, but I was very good at it. And I was never able to tune into school in a certain way where with microdosing, my brain was actually able to open up and I was able to read and write and absorb information. And, um, and like I said, learn anything outside of violence, you know, and movement and strength, just like this was all purely mental and just numbers and research and big words. Um, you know, I'm lucky because at the time I was dating a scientist, uh, a UCLA professor, a woman that sells her products on TV. She's incredibly well put together. And she she coached me through how to speak in front of cameras. I had a bunch of other scientists and researchers because I was ending up on these platforms where people were talking about psychedelics because I just learned the words and I was like, oh yeah, like this is what I'm learning. Everyone listen to me. I don't, I don't care if anyone doesn't like what I'm saying. It fixed me. And I know right. I can fix other people. I don't give a fuck what people say about me. <laughs> like I'm well, trying to well, you, you, you're telling your story and then you're telling what, what worked for you because we're not all created equal. Uh, and what's going to work for you may not work for me or, or, or might work for Tony. I mean, that, but so we have to, you have to search out a lot of different things. Yeah. And having a multi-pronged approach to any healing of your body and brain is really important. So, um, you know, I, I started 
working with you at the UFC on a, on a post fight concussion serum. They asked me to make Jeff Nowitzki took uh, me and my business partner out to lunch. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I can make that for you. Uh, it never came to fruition, but we started working with them. And I tried, was trying to do CBD studies in like 2015, probably 16 in 2019. I went back to the table and was like, look, let me do a psilocybin study. And they were like, you're nuts. Um, you know, this is no, and I'm like, no, I, I work with scientists. I work with these organizations. I work with universities. Uh, and, he, and Jeff Nowitzki goes, all right, well, you know, the rules, get me the FDA involved and get me a major university. And literally the call before that, I got the okay from Johns Hopkins and the FDA on the fact that I could pull this off. I, I know what I'm doing, you know, um, like I was ready for his, 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 uh, second swing. Um, and, we embarked on that. They ended up saying no, which it was too early. It was 2019. The uh, pandemic happened, and uh, I got I got I got on HBO Real Sports with Dean Lister. Dean Lister, who's a you know, legendary fighter, was yep. doing was doing real bad. And Dean's been a friend of mine for a while. He wasn't doing good at all. Uh, and he went through a mushroom trip. We all went through a mushroom ceremony on on Real Sports. And um, Dean, you said you, a mushroom ceremony. Yeah, we had shamans and they were Western shamans. They weren't the actual like real, you know, shamans, but they're good shamans, um, good healers. And they play the music for you and they bring you through the whole thing. We set it up. We were in this beautiful, it was our church, but it's a mansion up in the hills of San Diego. And I brought in like, you know, my grizzly bear rug and my wolf and my lynx. And it was like, looked so cool. Um, <laughs> you know, it was, it was like, it was a, an Emmy award winning camera crew. And it was still so intrusive. You shouldn't have cameras in the ceremony, but there was like a spotlight right in the middle. And it was just a lot. Uh, but anyways, Dean went through the whole process on camera, exactly what you want had to happen. The ego, death, dissolution, rebuild, new life, new thought process, all this stuff. And he's throwing up the whole time because he's detoxing off pills and alcohol, but he got it out in like one night. Um, so we go through that. I send that episode to Dana and Dana White is one of the first three people to get back to me. I, I sent it out to like a couple dozen people at once. And Dana got back to me right away, gave me a thumbs up. Um, you know, Dana's always been so good to me. I love that man. Uh, and he had Jeff call me a couple days later, I guess. And they tried to get back into the study. Study still didn't happen. Um, and now we're in a stage where... They've verbally agreed. And I know they'll go to bat for me. They'll go to the table. Like they've already been to the table twice with me, with CBD and with psilocybin. Um, it's about me pulling this off. It's not about them. Of course, they're kind of difficult. It's the UFC. They have a lot of parameters that I have to fall into. But but I figured it out. Um, University of Miami hit me up. And they're like, we want a chance. And I was like, okay, well, first we need to build a case study so I don't fuck this up again. I don't have many more bats. Or I'm at bats. Um so I said, let's do bare knuckle boxing. I work with, I'm, I'm Mark Irwin, Mark the Shark Irwin. I'm his, he's the world champion at 135 at bare knuckle. I'm his grappling coach. So we're trying to figure out a clinch system for bare knuckle, um, which has been a lot of fun. That, that sport's fucking crazy. Uh, it's good. And just, no, bare, I mean, bare knuckle boxing, it's, uh, most of those matches are very short lived because they, they take one or, one or two shots and, and you're done. And again, you have to be careful because you're going to hurt your hands in a process of, of, of the bare knuckle boxing as well. So it's, I uh, watch it, I go, wow. Yeah. And, and he and I both take really large doses of mushrooms before he fights. And it's a lot of fun. Um, but we'll get to that later. So back, okay. to, back to the study. Um, I was going to do bare knuckle boxing, you know, and, and have that be the case study. Cause all that, all the participants have to be in Florida for a week. They have to be at the university of Miami for a week. So uh, it's within three days of a TBI. So if anyone listening, little Billy got hit in the face with the baseball grandma slips and hits her head in the tub. Anyone who has a TBI within three days of it, get them to the university and I'll get them paid. I think it's like over a thousand bucks to go through this study. You have to pay for your flight. You have to pay for your, for your, your housing and food, but they'll put you through the study and scan your brain. Then you'll be able to see what your brain looks like. So you have an idea of how to fix it. That's very a driving force to see the numbers and analytics behind how fucked up your brain is. Um, so the UFC, um, I sent Jeff because he's my friend the fact that phase one started of the study, which is all novel technology stuff I've never even tested with, but I'm going to hopefully get tested when I go out there this uh, next week. <clears throat> so 
I did that. I sent it to Jeff and he goes, oh man, cool. I'm going to be in Miami next week, set up a meeting. So I was like, <clears throat> fucking rad. Um, they met and Jeff called me right after and was like, Ian, this is the best thing you've ever done. I'm really proud of you. Like, this is incredible. It's a TBI study. There's, we don't, the, the study with Johns Hopkins fell through because it was addiction and PTSD. And of course, are UFC fighters addicted to things? Yes. Are they, do they have PTSD? They, they climb into a cage and they fight people for blood money in their underwear and they give and receive PTSD the whole time. That's the job. Yeah. You know, that's what we fucking do. Uh, and it's a replay, which is great. Um, so, you know, this study falls exactly into what UFC needs. They don't have to put a dollar into it. All they have to do is fly whoever the person is that wants to do it from wherever the fight is to Miami. And they all handle the rest. You know, all I, as, I mean, I, I should, I, everyone says I should have a job doing this. Like both sides have brought it up that I should have a job. But if you're going to have me, you know, babysitting everybody, which I'm totally fine with, but traveling to fights and doing a concussion protocol and then taking them to Miami on a Sunday, like that's a lot of moving parts. You got to pay me a lot of money. Uh <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I I totally agree with you. I mean, Ian, I mean, it's, uh, you know, the reality is the UFC has been around for 30 plus years now. So now there is a bit of a, you, you can see this track record. You can see where, how many athletes are showing signs of, damage yeah brain damage uh and it's uh you know again you, you look at a sport like boxing that's been around for 100 plus years and you you just see individuals that uh i mean they've made a train wreck of their life but it's it's from all the percussions of, of each time that take a strike of how you bounce back i had i was always very careful about any of my workouts i did yeah. i always told people to protect the pumpkin the head, I always refer to the head as the pumpkin, always protect the pumpkin. And even, but in a lot of boxing matches, they're like, here, wear this headgear. You're not going to get cut. You won't get your nose broke or something like this, but it, it'll, you know, it will protect the exterior, exterior, but it's not protecting the interior, that gray matter, the brain. That's going to continue to get sloshed, sloshed, and sloshed some, some more. So I, I think I have, I think I have more followers now than i had way back then because you know the uc was nowhere near the magnitude that has grown to over the years but it's uh i have more people found me now because like oh dude you're you're 65 but you got you're, you're still sharp on cue and stuff like that you're not missing link i go well i i haven't my mind hasn't started to come unravel yet it will probably become a little bit more unraveled a little bit maybe a little bit further down the road but i've seen people a fraction of my age and uh, I mean, <laughs> their their ball of yarn is coming unwoven pretty good so far. <laughs> yeah, it's and that's sad. That's sad. It is, you know. And now, now it just the science hasn't caught up to the mainstream yet. And biohacking, not just psychedelics. I mean, psychedelics could be an easy fix where someone could just give you mushrooms, you weigh it out every morning, put it in your coffee, and or have someone give you a capsule or whatever. I can give you some gummies, um, and you'll see how how they're meant to just focus. They're not, this is not, it's not a tool to get high. If you want to get high, take four or five, whatever. Uh, these like are you were saying earlier with the micro dosing. Yeah. With the oh, micro -dosing. So, so what, so what the effect does that give you? Like physically you said, so it's just so, says so little, it's just a micro dose. So yes. it doesn't give you the intensity as it would have taken yeah. you. So um, a micro dose is supposed to be from say 50 milligrams <clears throat> to about 150, 200. And they make these gummies at 250. So technically you could cut it in half if you don't want to feel anything. Uh, if you want to have a slight little buzz, it's uh, it has ATP in there. So adenosine triphosphate, and that, that's an energetic source for the body on a cellular level to actually like work. Um, and you get a nice <clears throat> little energetic buzz, your shoulders drop, your smile goes up and your body kind of gets flowy. You know, you get into this like, okay, and, and you, you can... You can knock out all the outside distractions and focus on something and actually have like peace of mind to analyze things faster because um, four parts of your brain are all speaking in conjunction. They usually speak on their own, but now they're speaking um, more fluently. You're able to access thoughts and ideas, memories, you know, linguistic skills go up. You can, yeah. you can heighten all your senses. So you have, you know, you can hear better and see better. Yeah. yeah Joe Rogan swears by this stuff. I've seen him talk yeah. You know, it's times it's, it's and it's you know, you Mike can Mike Tyson, 
Yeah, Mike pushes it way too far. I've seen Mikey so much. I'm like, I used to work. Well, like you said, there's a difference from meeting just. Yeah, he'll just shovel him in, in there, and then he has. He tried to fight me one time. Um, <laughs> I was like, I'm not look. I'm not fucking afraid of you, dude. Let's just <laughs> chuck you out. Um, but you know, it, you 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 find because it gets it's, it's his appropriate. So do whatever you want, Mike. Like it's fine. It's not a yeah. he's not hurting anybody. He just just gets a little crazy sometimes. Um, you figure out what's comfortable for you. What is your dose? Just be the citizen scientist and don't ever talk to someone who goes, you take one of these every this many times. Like, no, 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 you figure it out. Because what these are, this is medicine. Medicine's meant to be used not every day. Medicine's yeah. used when it's appropriate. And, and this it, could get you, help you get off like drinking or like you said, helping people get yeah. off of heroin or other pills. Yeah. Uh, drinking is big. Pills is big uh, with those. Those two, you should still microdose, but you gotta you gotta take more. You gotta do more stuff than that because you know the body has such a pull to it. Uh, and peptides is where I would say to get off of, of heroin or alcohol. Um, and you can do literally five days of IVs, which you know you end up spending uh, two grand probably if you have someone come to your house and do it, maybe more. Um, but you you are completely reset, like a whole mitochondrial reset through things like NAD, which is a really amazing peptide and plus vitamin IVs and get your body healthy so it can detox. What uh, about people that had like a stroke? Let's say, cause like recently my brother had I'm a stroke. Did, did that, was this something that won't help out that part? Is it different? Um, no, it, you know, it can for sure. Actually, microdosing should help. Uh, I, I haven't got to work with anyone with a stroke yet. Um, but if you want, if you, I can send you some, we can do it. Uh, <laughs> it's not going to hurt. I mean, uh, I think it would be, yeah, cool. we're willing to anything. I would love something that could, cause he's been going recently. He just had a little relapse again and he's been going through a lot of pain and yeah, just, yeah. it just almost feels like he said his body's starting to shut down again, you know, and it would just, and then he goes to the doctor and they're like, Oh, you had a stroke a while ago, like a year ago. So it's just going to happen. Yeah. And you know, like my cousin right now is dying of ALS and I, I, I've been feeding him a fucking bunch of mushrooms for the last year. Um, I noticed two years ago, a little, yeah, a little over two years ago, I came back from the jungle doing ayahuasca and I showed up to my nephew's wedding and I was like talking to him. And you, when you do ayahuasca, you, you're, you vibrate at a different frequency that you guys, and you, you have to do it to understand. It's, it's not, we can't fathom it as a normal person. Um, and I saw him, I looked at my mom, my brother, and I'm like, Hey, like, what's up with Owen? And they're like, I don't know. He's just an asshole. That's just what he is. And I was like, no, 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 no. He, he is not doing good. Something's really wrong. And a year later, he's in a wheelchair. You know, um, that's something that, that plant medicines give you is this awareness of other people of yourself for sure, for introspectively and energetically and the words you're saying, what are the, what are the words you're, your, your stories you're telling yourself and what are the stories you're telling other people? Those are really important. You know, words are spells, life is magic and we can, we create this whole thing in front of us. Um, and, you know, I, I go super deep cause I, I coach them after, you know, I'm not a shaman. I was called the fight shaman on the cover of LA weekly, which is like 16 million copies and i told the guy i'm like hey whatever you do don't don't call me a shaman and he put it up there and i was like you fucking asshole <laughs> and all my friends in the industry laughed because they knew how it was, i would they just laughed they thought it was funny um they didn't hold it against me but you know um a big part is coaching these athletes because my nonprofit. i wish i had my shirt around here um athletes journey home where i'm taking 12 fighter or athletes in general i mean the last tally i had out of like six or seven people there was over 50 world titles that were at least interested in coming and that's in not just fighting that's in you know multiple sports um that would just want to come and, and take part of this because what we're going to do you know how the, the 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 tbi study with the ufc is within three days of it it's new we have they have to get those analytics i'm just taking anybody with brain damage because the bigger part i want is to, to tell the stories after because let's say you come down with me you know you're a fucking legend people will listen to you and people of, of a different age group and a, a full your lane like it, that's resonates that's what i need is as many people of diversity as i can and um uh, we take the athletes to Iquitos, Peru, to a place called the Ayahuasca Foundation. And it's 
one of the oldest and it's by far one of the best uh, places you can do ayahuasca because they have a lot of inf educational information that comes with it. It's not just the ayahuasca, uh, a lot of spirituality with it. Um, and we'll go down there. I'll test, I'll test everyone's brain and bodies and fecal matter, gut biome, blood, heart, everything I can't brain. I'll get this. You got, you got those, those type of uh, laboratories at, at your accessibility down there. Yeah. And down there, I don't know exactly what they have, but we've got access to stuff. And University of Miami wants to help out with this one. This one is with the University of Melbourne, but Miami will do whatever I say because they're cool. They are just like, hey, we want, we want in. Um, and they have all this new, this new technology that I don't even know about yet. I have to go see it maybe uh, next week. Um, so, you know, at least 12 athletes, bring them down and um, get them tested before, during and after. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll, be, they'll be sitting with a real amazing Shipibo shaman. Her name is uh, Maestra Bilba. Uh, I've never sat with her, but but she comes extremely recommended. And they have a new um, within the within the Ayahuasca Foundation. They have like the bougie five star and the four star. And they go, hey, this one's a little more rustic. And I was like, perfect. I want my boys and girls in the fucking mud. Uh, I don't. These are not. These are savages. They don't need. We get carted around the world and get nice shit. The last thing we need is that. We need to be in the mud with, with you know, doing real dietas with certain plants. And we need to really go through this experience because um, they need to tell the most powerful stories after. You know, the, the data, we can look at the like scale from black. This is all the dead tissue to white. How much of this gray in between can we fix? Can we get back to white or closer to white? And science tells me I can't fix the black but I don't believe science. I, I just, I just like to prove things. So we're going to try it. Um, but once we get that, you know, that scale of healing, we, we have them tell their stories. That's the most important part. And they go out there and whoever it is tells their story to their crowd and people listen, and we'll be shooting a documentary about it. Um, and the data, eventually what I would like is to, to, you know, that data is going to go to the University of Melbourne. It's going to go to the University of Miami, wherever it is. I, I, that's besides the point. Um, but it'll be free information about how to heal because we'll tell the stories. Um, and then uh, I, I am helping um, an organization called Being True to You, which is the the oldest coaching platform in the space. Um, we're building some some cool stuff for athletes right now. Uh, and I've, I've, never, I've never heard of this one before. Being, being True to You. Yeah, Being True to You, is, it's... it's um, it's about 12 years old and the amount of information, because I have my business, the McCall method, which is my coaching platform or my, you know, my, what I, the, the process I have of healing and I teach people. Mm -hmm. um, I, I realized that after I just went through their six month training course, I was like, I'm so out of my depth. There's no way I could ever put together anything even remotely like these people could do it. So they brought me on because they're amazing and because they're my friends. Um, and they, you know, they paid me to speak at their event in, um, out, out in New Mexico, which was incredible. Um, they'd probably love to have you speak next year if you want to come by. Um, well, again, again, I, I like the, the, the state model alone of New Mexico. It's the land of enchantment and there's a lot of uh, unique things about that state. That's for sure. Yeah. I, I, I'm going back to, I'm going to Durango. Um, I go to Miami next week for a ketamine retreat that I'm hosting, um, Actually, that's another thing. If you know anyone that that needs any healing, um, I, a bunch of people fell out next week. So I, I have like two or three spots open. It's a, a, a intravenous ketamine, so IV ketamine, and um, there will be three days. There will be yoga and and healthy food, and um, breath work, meditation, sound healings. You know, and then you have the uh, the IV ketamine. So it, a super healing for the brain and the body. People who are in pain. Uh, everyone has trauma, so we'll, we'll we'll get to the bottom of that. And again, I'm I'm coaching everyone through it. So, um, well, throw throw. What's going to be the best way for people to get cut in contact directly with you? So if if there's because that'd be like I told Tony's the, the gentleman that will be uh, yeah. that does all the, the putting the clips up, the things of the nature. And uh, so uh, let's let's you know we we usually wait to end this to let people know how to get contact, but we're going to, we're going to keep peppering this throughout because you can, you you put, provide some great information here right now. There Ian, for a lot of different people that, uh, regardless of what their age and, uh, you know, whether it be just, you know, if they're in the, the combat arts and then they're an MMA fighter and they're, and they're having some of these 
problems with with the brain stuff like that. But then uh, you got to look at. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm on the other side. I'm a senior citizen. You know, anyone that's over fifty years of age, you know, gets that uh, you know you know that ARP card. You know, right right then and there. So it's so, so <laughs> something you don't want to get. I could care less if I get ten percent or twenty percent discount at Denny's in the morning. It's uh, <laughs> I'm I'm doing okay for myself. But uh, if we if we can help other people out there, no, that's where. Throw, throw out your, if, if people want to contact you directly, what's the so best way? Find me at Ian McCall on Instagram. That's always the best way. If you want to go to my website, the McCall method, um, you can contact me there <clears throat> or, um, oh, Athletes Journey Home. Athletes Journey Home is my is my new nonprofit website, uh, .com, .org. I think we have both of them. Um, the McCall method and you said the Journey Home? A athletes Journey Home. Oh, Athletes Journey Home. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I'm bouncing around. I'm looking to do a mushroom and jujitsu retreat later this year. You know, I have this ketamine retreat that's free. The mushroom retreat, you have to pay for it because we're in, we're in Mexico. But ketamine retreat, they come out. They, um, you know, probably end up staying with me at the Hard Rock. And um, we will, you know, go through a bunch of stuff. And then after, after, after that, it's three days of healing. The next day I have to go to Durango to um to sit with this organization and see where we land. Cause I'm <clears throat> working with a with um I'm I'm allowed to say SEAL Team Six guys. Uh they were like, look, you're never supposed to say SEAL Team Six, but you can brag about it. And I was like, Yes, fuck yeah. Uh I love SEAL Team Six guys, or just SEAL Team. I love military in general, special forces have have my yes. my heart because I've hung out with them for my whole for, for so long. Um, <clears throat> so many of them that I know over the years being in fighting and then teaching all over the planet in Japan and Texas and stuff. Uh, I, I did a lot of USO work um, with the military. So that, that's how, how I actually started my nonprofit was working with an organization called the uh, Heroic Hearts Project. And they sent me on a trip to be a coach. Um, well, they asked me to be a coach uh, and the, the, the CEO. And I was like, look, I went through some really traumatic shit. I can't, I can't do that right now. And he goes, all right, just go heal. He's like, cool, man. I got you. Love you. Just go down there. He's a good friend of mine. He's like, go heal. And I did uh, three days of ayahuasca, a giant mushroom trip, uh, uh, five MEO or, or sapo ceremony, all in one Let week. Let me just, I, I hate to interrupt you, Raku, but, but you, you keep referring to a lot of mushrooms here right now, but it's kind of going, all right, I, I'm an Alvis on the outside. So what, what kind of mushrooms are we talking about? That so group? there, this is actually the place I went, Arcana. Um, and okay. It's a it's a retreat center in Mexico. They have ones in Peru as well. There's mushrooms, which is uh, psilocybin, and the mushrooms they serve in Mexico are the Nino Santos or little teachers, and you sit with Mazatec shaman. Those are the first. Those are the the most legit or you know the most well known mushroom shamans in Mexico. Uh, the first woman to ever give mushrooms to a Westerner or white man was Maria Sabina. She's part of that that tribe. And I got to sit with her niece. Um, the, the, the ayahuasca is not a mushroom. The ayahuasca is, is, is a plant and a vine that are from the Amazon. And they are mixed uh, into a brew and cooked over. Because the mushrooms, you just break up and, and, and you just take them. Um, you dry them out, you break them up and take them. Um, you have pulverize them so you can, you can digest them easier. Um, the ayahuasca has to be cooked, has to be brewed for, for a few days. And then um, they both hit the same receptors. Uh, dose dependent, you can have very similar level experiences. Mushrooms were always down here, but people weren't taking enough. And like I took 20 grams. Like most people take three and a half grams and they feel uh, they have outer body experiences. Uh, a hero dose is only five grams. I took 20 because I science. I like science. Uh, I like to explore the inner reaches of my of my brain and consciousness. And I had to heal from something. I, I saw something very, very traumatic happen. And not just, it culminated with one real event, but there was six months of fucking gnarliness um, in my life. And, um, you know, the pandemic made people do crazy shit. Oh, yeah. The, the so, pandemic, uh, yeah. No, the, 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 the problem, yeah. the greatest meme I remember from that era was uh, showing the standard family has showed a mother, father, a couple of children, and they're all and they're all hiding behind the couch. And they're all masked up. And as they're peeking around, you know, just I think it was just the dad that was peeking around and just watching the TV. That's that was like the beam. I think if that doesn't paint the picture, nothing, nothing will. I mean, the fact that you're 
wearing masks in your own home. I mean, I, I still see people even if here I came down that they'll be driving down the car uh, by themselves with the mask on. on. I might go on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. And it's, they're never worn right either, you know? So you're just like, okay, I can't. A I chin can't diaper. Even. Yeah, like what do you what what do you think's happening here? I mean, where do you live under a rock? <clears throat> like what do you watch TV? Like what what is there? Like you have to understand like what sort of shit are you putting? What's digesting in your brain to make you think this is still like a thing? Oh, again, all these five minutes, you know, they had all these things. And, and you go to a grocery store or something like that. They had these little markers like five. You know, keep it five. Uh, you know, five yards from each other, stuff like that. And it's like going. I I, I think there's a couple times. I think I took up my cell phone, take a little picture, look at. I'm tippy toed over the light here, stuff like that. I'm living life on the edge, you know, with that. I call it like the germs stupidity. I, yeah. Again, I I said this before on the podcast, but when the when the United States was shut down, I mean, we're literally they were telling people not to get out on the road. The only people that could be on the road were first responders, you know, people like truck drivers, stuff like that. People that you know that that you had that's a necessary type of people out there. I was in Michigan at the time. I had to be back out in Arizona as I'm driving down the road. I'd be literally, when I say I'm the only car on the road, I'm the only car on the road. As I'm getting towards the, the border, back on, if I go see the National Guard, if I go be see the state police, turn me back, no one's at the border because they're 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 threatening all this stuff, this kind of stuff. Keep on motoring. I finally come up to the first tractor trailer and I'm just I pass them. I kind of look up, look up at, at the, the camp. Truck driver, you know, he looks looks on down at me, gives me the thumb up, toots his horns and stuff like that. But I go, give you a thumb up, toot the horn, kept on going. But but when I say I'm the only car on the road, I mean literally, I was the only car on the road driving for hundreds of miles, passing a couple tractor trailers. Even when I pulled in the very first gas station, because gas stations are staying open very late because no one's driving. They're shut down a lot earlier, so I'm not gonna wait till I need. Uh, I, I'm on gas fumes to to pull in to fill up. Get them if I'm hit underneath the half a tank, I'm filling right back up again. Well, even when I would walk into this gas station, people are looking at me like, "Who, who that?" You know, as I go, it's like go. They, they thought they saw a ghost or something like that. They go, "Just need 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 some gas, some go go juice to keep going down the road." But again, but Americans, Americans are quick to forget. And that's the one thing I don't like about most Americans. They're, they're too quick to forget, too quick to forgive. And uh, I always tell people, I'm, I'm, kind of like, I'm kind of like the biblical, but not New Testament. I'm Old Testament. I come with hell, fire, and brimstone. And <laughs> I want an eye for an eye. Okay, but you've stayed in your own fight career. You were you were crazy out there, and you you know you put it all online. So yeah, I think you know. I've been I've been anti-establishment my whole life. Um, now I I <clears throat> I talk to the establishment. Like I talk to the DEA. I talk to people in the CIA. You know they call them spooks. Um, you know, like I'm part of a coalition that is with like three-star general and politicians and these you know people in um, on Capitol Hill. I need to go to DC actually. It's kind of weird. Uh, <laughs> it's really weird, but. They tell me, hey, keep going, because they take my product, because the cops and the firemen and the first responders and, um, the, you know, their wives love my products. They're great. Their parents, their grandparents, their kids, everyone's taking these sort of things because around here, everyone's educated, you know, and I'm not doing anything stupid. I'm not pissing anyone off. I'm very nice to everybody for a good fucking reason, because I live an illegal lifestyle, pretty much. I mean, I'm now, you know set the flag down of, of I'm an actual researcher. Um, but this whole time I've been a preacher for, for a couple of churches. Uh, you have to align yourself with the spiritual and churches because religion, they will not fuck with. Um, politically, I know all the you know, political people. Um, for me to, for me to do what I did, I had to make sure that I didn't fuck this up. I didn't lose my kid. I didn't, you know, like I practice everything very, very uh, harm preventative, I don't spook the horses, even though I'm in Forbes and I'm on HBO and I'm on the cover of these magazines. I, I try and be um, respectful and, all, you know, you all always, always pay your taxes. Uh, you know, these certain things you have to do um, with when working with with uh, fringe things. And, and I'm doing the right I'm doing it for the right cause. Everyone knows I'm just trying to help. 
Um, and and I, I'm because I'm not the doctor or scientist, I can do and say a lot of things they can't, which I take I, I, I take as an honor because they're saying the same stuff. They just can't talk about it, but I can't. So, um, because you can't take my degree away. Like I don't have one. I barely graduated high school. <laughs> like you guys thought I was fucking retarded back then. So um, <laughs> that, I'm smart. Um, you know, and, and I don't know. I, I also look at it this way. Dr everyone, everyone, a lot of people like altered states of reality at, at a young age, people start liking it. Um, and you know, my, my friend's daughter just passed away. She was 14 and died of a fentanyl overdose and such this, this young woman would not do fentanyl her stepdad who raised her is strung out and is a junkie her dad's dead um not from drugs he got shot to death but um still a lot of drugs in that guy's life and he wasn't you know he wasn't around much um some creep was trying to you know sleep with her or whatever i may I'm, from what i understand and he gave her a cannabis gummy with fentanyl in it and i had to i had to put my tail between my legs and apologize to my ex-wife and say, I'm sorry. I said, you're full of shit. They're not putting drugs and gummies, you know, or for like things like just candy. I was like, I, I don't know. Um, you know, it was, it, I, I, I know, I'm no, I'm no longer working in like the, the illicit space as much as I used to. I came up there. That's where we're, we're literally where I come from business wise. So they know that. And I do consulting in the space, but right now I'm not the face of any brand. Um, you know, I help people access good medicine, but not on some crazy large scale or anything. It's just people that I'm, you know, people that I, I work with, you know, daily, uh, clients that come over, friends that need it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm providing care. I provide care for people, not just, not just gummies and stuff like that. There's more to it. Um, you know, so I, it, there's, I, I like bringing up the market part because, there's a there's multiple production houses in, in San Diego, LA, Orange County that are making really good products that don't have this stuff in them. So if you can find a source um, of getting them, it's out there and you can take things so safely. But there's even, I mean, I've heard fentanyl is in ketamine, is in all kinds of gummies. So you, you got to be really, really careful where you source anything. Um, it doesn't have to be for me. I don't care. I just want you to understand where it's coming from because um, you can die and nobody wants that. I mean, you're just trying to have a good time, you know? Yeah, well, again, that's where Fred has been, but the big thing that has come across, like, the Mexican border, you know? So, had to be really careful about that. Let's, okay, I, I, I might be throwing you a curveball, but uh, as I was doing a little bit of research on you, there was a nickname that came up that I kind of asked him about. Does I get this Uncle Creepy? Uncle, Uncle Creepy. creepy. Yeah. So I finally got rid of this stupid nickname. What happened was I used to make fun of everybody for having nicknames like Chuck Liddell. I'm like, oh, you're the ice man. You're going to freeze me, you dick. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Like my older brother or Tito Ortiz, the Huntington Beach bad boy. I'm like, you gave yourself that nickname. Stop it. Um, you know, he, and I just, I, I'm, I've also been, I've been a comedian for the last five years and I don't do it anymore because I don't have time. I, saw well, I mean, you actually did actual stand up. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and oh, I, well. I love pretending I'm funny. I'm not that funny, but I tell good stories. Um, so I got out of rehab the second time, and I <clears throat> I was there for six months. I wanted to go see my friends, so I went to San Luis Obispo, and uh, everyone got hammered, of course. I'm not going to get in anyone's way of their, their fun. <clears throat> so sure. I was the designated driver. And uh, we take everyone home from the bars. It's probably like 2.33 in the morning, and my friend's son is up. And he's won't go to bed. I'm trying to tire him out. Um, and Uncle Ian, Uncle Ian, Uncle Ian, Uncle Ian. And he goes, Uncle Creepy. And everybody sat up and they were like, that's it. You have a nickname now. And I was like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> that, not a real popular one, I don't think, though. Okay. I, I was like, what? Okay. I didn't think it was going to stick. Um, Team Oyama, or, or Colin Oyama, I should say, the head coach of Team Oyama was my, my coach. And he goes, hey, you just hang out at the gym all day. You need money, right? Because, you know, again, being fresh out of rehab, I was sober and in a weird fucking place. Uh, and I said, yes. So I fought this guy, Jeff, that I know. Um, and I won quickly, you know, and, and I didn't know. But when I signed everything, my team put Uncle Creepy as the, na as the nickname for it. <laughs> So I came out, Ian McCall makes a comeback. He does wins this quickly. And this is his new nickname. And I was like, fuck, okay. Um, and I just didn't really 
think about it too much. Well, I tried to get rid of it and, and everybody was like, no, this is your nickname. Do not change it. So it stuck. And I regret, regrettably it stuck. Um, the UFC put it as my, my, my actual blue check mark name. So it was there for like, oh. there for like 10 years. And now that I'm a scientific researcher, <laughs> this nickname has gotten in the way of literally job opportunities and all respect from my peers and all this sort of shit, but it's finally gone. Fine. I, I need to get it off of Twitter, but I don't use Twitter really. So who cares? Um, but I guess maybe it might be a good idea if I, if now that Twitter's changing, I should, I can get on there. And well, well, Ian, I can just simply tell just by conversing with you here for, for, you know, this past time that we've had this opportunity. I mean, you have not taken uh, that many shots to the head. You're a, you're a sharp cat. Uh, and, Definitely a lot more of an intellect that I would expect to see in the MMA uh, industry. Yeah. So I think moving on or stay away from that industry is a good thing because we need to protect brains like yourself and yeah. to uh, to do a lot more good things because you're, you're on a good path. I like what you're what, what you're doing. I didn't know what to expect when I first told, I was asking Tony about this uh, interview, but uh, I go, it, this is uh, this has been great. I've enjoyed this very much. Thank you. I, I I did take a lot of shots though. That's the thing. I I put myself in the hospital for a couple of days snowboarding when I hit my face as a kid. Uh, I got punched in the head since I was four. Um, the, I I can't even count the amount of concussions that I had I, over the years. Um, and psychedelics is what healed my brain. That's what really really helped do it was the psychedelics. Um, and you know cleaning up my whole life on top of that was my gut biome, the inflammatory response in my body. It's a whole top-down approach. Um, but yeah, th this, I was, I wasn't able to converse like this for, for, for at the very end of my career. I was not, I was not doing good. And, and um, you know, I, I've, I've most recently came out of retirement, not to fight. I don't ever want to fight again. I, 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 I can't give and receive PTSD or, or brain damage when I'm researching it. It's not right. Um, but I came out of retirement for a jujitsu match to get word out about what I'm doing about my nonprofit uh -huh. research. And that's kind of snowball. I said I was going to be one and done, but I realized that this is the greatest way for me to build the brand as the CEO is to get out there and perform. Cause I never got to cement my legacy. Um, the UFC made me a superstar for like you know, five years I was showing up to other countries and girls were crying it was really weird uh you know but I, I never got to technically show or I never got to show how technically good I really was because I, I was pitched as the fucking one of the next greatest you know that, that could have ever been and I it's because I'm that good uh but I was never well, able no no actually again I, I'll stop you for a moment there because uh you know again read it on your background stuff like that and, and uh, here that you beat to beat Demetrius Johnson, stuff like that. I'm thinking, well, this this was a because I I had heard of Demetrius. I actually watched a couple of his matches on top of all that, so I knew about him, and and to know that you you beat him, I think, wow, this 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 guy is, is he's he's the real deal here. So, I'll, no, you're. Uh, I enjoy being able to speak to you here, but also just learning more about your your background there because you you also came from being an amateur wrestler. Yeah, you, you did a few other things there in your 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 youth there that wrestlers again. It's just just my uh, biasness, but I, I I I get along just fine. Some of my greatest friendships have been with my fellow teammate wrestlers, whether they from be from high school, college, or different uh, teams going abroad that uh, we're still in contact with each, with each other because there's there's no other sport like where you slap hands, you go hard takedowns for the next 20, 30 minutes, and then when it's like, when it's all done, you slap hands again, well, you got me tonight, dude, you son of a gun there, but I'll be back tomorrow. You know? Counting every point in your head, like, this motherfucker got three points today. Yeah. No. You know, and that, that, that was uh, wrestling, even over fighting, was the greatest thing I've ever done over jujitsu, over, you know, that, that wrestling was, was, was what really made me a man. It's really what made me different within the rep, within the fighting space and the jujitsu space. You know, obviously I've got, I've been doing jujitsu for just as long as I've been wrestling. I've been doing jujitsu for 26 years, wrestling for 26 years, kickboxing for, um, I mean, real kickboxing probably started at like 15, 16, but it was 
you know, I didn't get to Timo Yama till I was 19. Um, and um, I just, I, I live for this. And martial arts is so good to me. And wrestling has been, it's the foundation of everything that I do. You know, I, I, I truly appreciate it. And I, I wish I would have maybe stuck out my fighting career for a little longer. Cause I, I mean, back then I had the opportunity to do that because there was no real industry, um, you know, but I wouldn't be the, I, I don't know. I, I, I just, I, I couldn't go to school. Stanford tried to, to bring me in San Francisco. Um, and I just, I wasn't good at school. So that's why I never didn't, didn't do it. I, I mean, if I had, well, the I, I, don't, I think yes, you, you, you actually are very good at school. It's just that you did not conform to the traditional style yeah. of school. Yeah, back back then I wouldn't have I wouldn't have, I was failing out out of junior college when I wrestled at Cuesta up in Central California, and it was just like okay I don't know how to do homework, I don't I can't pay attention to this, um, and so I, I was you know I, I was hanging out with Chuck Liddell and Antonio Banuelos and those people you know Glover Teixeira all the time so I was like okay I'm a fighter like that's what that's what this is where I need to be and when I, I the first practice they saw me move around, Antonio Benuelos was the WEC. He was the last world champion at 135s in WEC before Zufa bought it. And this is my my best friend. And he was Chuck's right hand back then. And um, they just took me under their wing. I had known Antonio since I was 15. And I showed up to slow. And they're like, you're hanging out with us now. You don't need friends. <laughs> I was like, okay, cool. Uh, you know, I just started hanging out with them. And uh you know, they saw me getting the better of Antonio, who was 25, and um, I was some random 19-year-old kid. You know, on the feet, he was a little better, uh, but not by much. You know, wrestling, like, not by much. Jiu-Jitsu, I had better jiu-jitsu. I could submit him, and people were just like, who the fuck is this kid? Um, so Chuck and them said, you're the next world champion. Like, this is it. So, you know, I had some very amazing mentors and people pushing me in the space, obviously. So um, I just... As my mom says, I wish you would have just gone to the Olympics. <laughs> like, thanks, mom. Fuck, can't win with you. Uh, but it, that would have been a fun dream to go wrestle at the Olympics and represent my country. And um, you know that that I don't know. That's always been something that I that I I, I mean regret. You know, I, I think would would have been a good a good choice for me. Well, yeah, those opportunities are they're hard to come by. I mean, that's uh, I mean, it was kind of ironic because I was, but again, I was looking at some of the information about you that you were you were born in July of nineteen eighty four. Now, <laughs> I was born in May. I don't know why it says I. I don't know how to fix my 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 uh, Wikipedia, but it, okay, a bunch of shit in there is wrong. It's weird. It's a, somebody who right. doesn't like me with that thing. Well, yeah. were, were you okay? Were you were you born in eighty four? Yeah, May May seventh. Oh, okay. Well, again, I, you know, my, I guess my whole my whole point in bringing that up was that 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 was my, the 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 crux of and and my athletic career that had everything gone right for me, I would have retired in 1984. But because things didn't go the way I'd hoped for them, you know, being kind of uh, politically screwed on over and stuff like that, so it's kind of like going. I continued to move on, so and and do things. Yeah. yeah so even answer, when I finally had a chance to, to have a little face to face with the. Uh, uh, Dan Gabe at that point in time outside the, uh, the Olympic arena. Uh, he's like going, uh, you're, you just won't give up. No, actually at, at, at the uh, Dan Gable uh, National, uh, they've got this Hall of Fame deal that made in Waterloo, Iowa. And uh, I, I had me back there being inducted into this this event. He, he showed up to it and he pulled me off the side. He says, so we had a nice little conversation. He goes, you just won't quit, will you? I go, I go, I don't know whether to punch you in the face or give you a big kiss on the lips. I said, because I said, it's because of you. I go, I did not retire back in 84, but I kept on going. And you were one of those inspirations to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all, we all need those, you know. Um, well, I mean, we're all, we're all going to have adversity happen in our lives. It's just... How do we handle that adversity? Do we go up on the drunken bender and uh, do, do something stupid, or do you try to do something you know more productive with your with your life? That's all. Yeah, I, I read philosophy after all my classes, and try and tie whether it's Stoicism or Miyamoto Musashi or Rumi or whoever it is uh, after my classes, and try and tie it into life and the techniques we learn and everything, and. Um, you know, imparting wisdom on people is is such a big part of what we do as coaches. You know, I I I I 
took, you know, pressure does two things. It bursts pipes and creates diamonds. And I, we're trying to create a, a diamond out of you. And if, if you do burst along that way, I want it to be here on the mat because I want you to be able to understand you're going to fucking live. You're going to be fine. You know, you have to be able to, 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 to go through it. And, you know, most of the quotes, most of the, the talks just go come down to that pressure. What are the pressures that I'm putting on you? I'm making this suck for you at times. I'm letting you come in and taking whatever you want, whatever part of my gi, and you can't finish shit. And then I reverse you and I make it suck for you for another minute. And then I put it in play. You know, it's like this constant pressure and change on us is what um makes us realize when you this too shall pass. Something else good or bad's coming at us. So get yeah. ready. You know, fucking buck up. We got stuff. Yeah, well, again, that's a good. That's always tell people you got to better have a good backbone out there anymore because it's uh, that's uh, the, you know, the reality of it all. It's uh, a very uh, <laughs> a very strange world that we live in, to say well, the least. Yeah, I, I when I first started teaching the things that I teach in psychedelics, I was like, oh, the masculine, and then I realized how bastardized both those words, masculine and feminine, would have been completely just non just change into something else so i say yeah. you know what i live the martial way i i whether you're a male or female the things that i teach you um i now hold you to a higher standard of living yeah you are the protector we are the ones that are going to have to rise up if anything goes down and protect these people and um confrontation doesn't always have to come in, in physical you know just a voice some posture eye contact like not today satan you know that can break most of it so it's like how are we gonna teach these people the right thing because society's teaching them the exact opposite and there's going to be pushback obviously um you know we're gonna sure. we're gonna swing to the opposite end of everything um just to, to you know to something we don't like on this side either um you know and and i guess i, I mean as i grow up i guess i become more of a conservative um of course because i you know, my, 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 my great, great, whatever great grandfather was president of the United States of America. Um, he was Franklin Pierce, the guy that started the civil war for slavery, um, which has been a funny topic to talk about on stage, <laughs> but, you know, I perform a lot in LA and here in Orange County. So it's a, it's very different from white to black or urban to whatever you want to call it, you know, San Diego, Mexican, I, I'm a half breed. So I kind of say whatever I want. Um, but I've been around politics and my, my dad loves politics and just the area I'm in, it's a bunch of Trumpsters, you know, it's just, I see a lot of it. And as someone who's a felon, I, I can't vote, but I feel like I, I obviously as an adult, I need to pay attention to it and see uh -huh. what the intricacies are of it because I'm very open. Obviously I'm a drug researcher. Like I have some views that are here. I have a lot of gay friends, uh, certain, you know, like I, I go back and forth, but I know that I'm, you know, trying to have a conservative value of being a protector, not a predator, um, you know, because people are, you know, going to have fun, but we need to make sure we need to be like the balancing uh, stick for, for everybody. Yeah. Well, so well, it was the 14th president of the United States. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. Apparently he was a horrible president. He wasn't even yeah. a Yankee and he started the civil war for slavery. It was a business, obviously. Well, that's um, what it all is. It's still a business. Maybe one million percent. I, I, I mean, I just think of like, man, what did my family do? Like, well, I want to see what sort of you know people they were. Like, go back in time, um, and just just to see because everyone had slaves. Um, so you can you know like all these founding fathers. It was just what culturally because they make him out to be an asshole. So um, I would like to see maybe he's, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> I'm sure he was just doing what everybody else was back then. Like it's just. You know? And still, look at well, look at who we have running the show now. Look at that family, so the, the the Biden crime family, right? I mean, I looked up Hunter's net worth is two hundred and twenty five million dollars. I was like, whoa! What's the last thing Biden's going to do before he gets impeached? Or, or that probably never happened, but he's going to he was going to pardon his family from everything. Of course, of and course, his last act. A baby's worth like millions, right? Yeah. And did they transfer money over in a baby's name? Yep. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Yeah, every one of them has their own LLC, I guess. Yeah. If if you're not cheating, you're not trying hard enough. I get yeah. it. <laughs> that's what I was taught in, in wrestling. Um, and every rich person games the system. I hear people constantly around me because everyone's so fucking rich around here. They're always got this thing they're doing to save money and make more money. Um, but 
you know, you can't, they, you fucking push it a bit far. Like they're so blatantly bad and just full of shit. And they're running. It's just like, oh man, you want to just shake them like babies. Just, dude, what are you doing? How are you here? Where's the microphone? Where's Barack Obama? Pull that curtain back. You know what I mean? Like yeah. fuck's going on here. Cause this shit's Pull the curtain back. See who's running the show. There He's you not, go. That, that old dope is not doing shit. He can't navigate stairs. He can't ride a bike. He can barely put out a proper sentence. So well, but there's some, some some really good funny memes that keep coming out on him. That's for sure. It's 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 hilarious, but like ang- it makes me so mad sometimes. Oh, like, oh fuck, man. Yeah. No, oh, I tr- trust me. It's uh, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. <laughs> I'm right there with you. And yeah, man, that's insane. Uh, all right. Hopefully, we'll, well see. Did, did did you happen to see or hear anything about the video about the people that that yacht fight that broke out just the other day? Well, like, on the. Yeah, on the dock. Yeah, there are people trying to dock their boat. Did you hear about that, Dan? Just happened no. just the other few days ago. What, 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 I mean, where? Um, shit, I forget where it was at. But these people were trying to dock their boat, and I guess they were in the way of someone, and the people that were on their boat got off and attacked security, and then it just turned into a freaking rumble with about freaking, I don't know, a bunch of I people. I mean, are we talking about a good size boat? Are we talking about like a yeah, little yeah, boat? Or? Yeah, they were good sized boats. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Like, yeah, and they were just, but it turned into like, I guess to the point to where one guy, security guy, literally jumped off the boat, swam back over to the dock, and so he could freaking get in the fight. And they were all, it's all over the internet. Like dozens some, of people fighting. Yeah, dozens. Yeah. It was a, it was a rumble, it broke out. So, yeah, some lady got hit with a chair that was laying on the, already laying on the ground, and some dude freaking come up and smash a chair over and, Look like the security guards end up getting the best of those guys, though. Yeah, towards the end, but it was it's insane. Just like, a, and then the big riot that just happened in what was it, New York, for some free giveaway. It was like last week or something. Uh, that, that that whole thing, like that's why it's nice here in Orange County because you're behind the orange curtain. It's the one percent, mm-hmm. you know. It's a bunch of well-armed Republicans who who of, of all races now. It's not just white people anymore, um, but. You know, from Huntington Beach to San Clemente, you have basically like this pocket of people that don't give a fuck about um, COVID. Like, I mean, in Huntington Beach, we've had a speakeasy since since COVID started that's had over 200 shows, comedy and music. There's been comedy, music, smokeouts, birthdays, um, cooking contests, women's empowerment, comedy classes. Like it's this amazing free space in my buddy's backyard called the HB patio where uh, they have a local brewery sponsors them. So free beer, everyone's a dope dealer. So there's a bunch of free weed. They roll like a couple hundred joints. Um, Everyone deals in psychedelics. So Mm. there's, there's, I bring tons of free psychedelics just to test out on people. (laughs) You know, there's always something going around. Then there's free food, free food. uh, And the, 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 the comedy show has been free up until like, a month ago and now it's a 25 dollar um uh membership and you know we, we've been doing this the no one ever stopped there's never a mask worn the cops have shown up a couple times and like watched you know hung out um so it's it's a it's a really fun place here in orange county but you have la is right there and la is a fucking cesspool i love la because that's where all, most of my friends are. My, my daughter says, that's where daddy goes to do adult things. Um, you know, I get to go be a celebrity and hang out with weird people. Um, and it's fun, but it is such a, you're, you're never not in danger there. There's always some, some sketchy shit going on in LA. And San Diego's a little better, but not really. Um, and, you know, you you just see the like infringements of those things, hopefully not, but I think they'll start coming to LA you know, or sort of coming into Orange County to see what sort of crazy shit happens. I mean, the riots that happened in in, uh, in Huntington Beach, like people, I think COVID was more or less people being sick and tired of being sick and tired. But now you have these people rioting who are, they're like, just weird reasons to riot, inappropriately doing dumb shit. You're just like, what are you, why? Because they didn't get free shit. Yeah. yeah, yeah like, well, especially, especially when you do smash the grab, you know, long, yeah, you know, that's uh there's there's a lot of stupid uh, ideas kind of we're coming up all during this whole COVID type of thing and dollar amounts and the whole nine yards I'm going and so turnstile of uh, let you know, booking people in and just let them right back out again to just I had a cop tell me he goes I could catch you with it was either eight or nine ounces of cocaine on you right now 
and I and I could I would look at it and I'd have to give it back to you and send you on your way. And I was like, you're full of shit. You would take it. Don't lie to me. <laughs> but uh, but you wouldn't arrest me. He goes, no. And I was like, wow, man, this is it's lawless in downtown. I've had friends get run up on who are in their, you know, fucking one of my buddies was in this Ferrari, uh, big, beautiful Ferrari. And he pulls up and there's videos of Instagram on Instagram of it happening. And he got out with his concealed permit and started pistol whipping the dudes. And he just he didn't he didn't he's like I didn't want to shoot him. He's like they're just two unarmed fucking young black kids. Um, he goes, I just beat the shit out of him with the butt of my gun. <laughs> I was like, rad. That's fucking amazing. Is it true that homeless people now there's some that they set up a tent like nobody can you can't bother them like that's their area? Um, it was for a while. Things have changed. Things have tightened a little bit. They've cleaned up the streets a bit, um, but it's still it's still dangerous as fuck, man. And um, the cops can't do anything if someone like attacks you or someone raids your or you know just comes into your house like that. They're, they're not. It'll be they'll be there. It'll be a while, you know. Like I mean, they can't do shit. There was groups of, of armed armed young people, um, and I hate to you know put it on any certain race, but it's all black people, uh, young black people coming up from the hood, um, and w- walking down the streets of Beverly Hills where some of my friends live with baseball bats and shit, knocking on doors. If they open the door, they're coming in, you know, like. And they're, they're fucking robbing the shit out of people. I know a guy that got shot in the ass. You know, again, four young black kids rolled up on him, followed him somewhere. They got out. Their security guard got in a gunfight with these kids. Uh, he got shot. He killed two of them and put the uh, third out of the fourth in the hospital. And my buddy got shot. He had two cell phones like this, two iPhones connected like this in his back pocket. And it hit him right there and stuck the cell phones together. Didn't hurt him. I mean, it should hurt, but he yeah. didn't, you know, didn't penetrate skin. Wow. Um, and it's, that's, what's been happening, you know, um, or people come in to steal mufflers and shit off cars. They can do the getaway with tweakers running up and be in full band saws, be take it out and, and run, you know, and they'll have like <laughs> one or two tweaked out dudes with like tire irons waiting for people to come out fucking, ah, ah, and they'll jump in the car and steal it. And you're like, dude, where the fuck do I live right now? It's, it's crazy. I mean, insane. Most of the women I date are in, are in Hollywood area for this is where, where I hang out. Um, and most of them don't even want to go out. Like they don't even, they don't want to, it's too dangerous. They're, they're afraid. They all tint their windows. It's, you know, someone can just run up on you and take whatever the fuck you have. <laughs> that's not, that's not cool. And they would just get away with it. The cops will do nothing. You and if you get... defend yourself, you're going to get in trouble for like salt on them or hurting that person. Um I've seen some shit lately of store owners beating up people and, you know, people defending themselves. So it's like when those same cops that tell, tell me about, the, you know, how much cocaine they can give back to me, they're like, you should carry a gun. And and I'm going to the process of getting my felonies expunged to get a concealed permit because I'm, I'm helping consult for a, a security company. Uh, one of my good friends um, and, you know, like for my daughter's school, I would love to, I'm retired. I'd love to be able to carry a gun and, and go be security at her school a couple of days a week and also set up the account. So we can have other, you know, former military dudes watch the school because it's the school in the parish and right down the street from her school, there was a school shooting. So this, you know, at private schools, especially that they, they, they want it, they want to pay for it because um, it's deserving. And, and, and you give, we give a former veteran, <clears throat> a job a person we give an american a job you know or maybe they're not well i mean i guess we'll be americans uh there's just a lot of military people that go into it not everyone has to be american that sounded kind of it's not silly uh but you get what i'm saying they're good honest hardworking people that need a fucking job you know with with papers and um prior experience so again former law enforcement former marines former whatever and um they get paid an honest wage to protect people because that's what we train them to do and now you get out just like with fighting. This is one thing I help athletes do is what's next after you're fighting. Cause you, you stop fighting or you get out of the military. That's everything, you know, that's your program, exactly. your life. And after no wonder you want to kill yourself. You have nothing. There's no phone calls. There's no checks. There's no uh, adoration for there. You just, it all just vanishes. You're like, what the fuck? Um, so giving these men and women an opportunity to do what they've been programmed to do. And that's protect my my children or our children yeah we we need to pay them a, a, a fair great good wage and give them a gun because bad people are out there and they keep preying on children and um this has to happen you know so I, i'm again in the process of uh 
getting my felonies expenses. I haven't been in trouble in over a decade. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, to be able to be. How long do you need to wait before you get, get it expunged? Uh, I, I, I messed up the paperwork the first time. <laughs> oh. So now I'm literally going to my mom's house. And she's like, I'll help you do it. I'm like, Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you, mom. Because I, I, I'm not good at paperwork. Um, so we'll get it done, get it turned in. They said all I have to do is just redo it and put a date in this one spot and turn it in. Um, some of the stuff already got expunged. Like I think, I think there was five or six different things that were on my record that needed to be taken off, and I got rid of two or three of them already. So nice. They'll get taken off, and and I'll um, you know, uh, I'm a, the owner of of my of the security company owns the gym that I teach at, and uh, he is one of my dear friends, a former uh, pararescue man. He goes, if I got you your stuff expunged, would you, would you work for me? I was like, of course. He goes, you're the most dangerous person I know. <laughs> He's like, you know, guns, you know, knives, you know, you know, spatial awareness. And you just have this, that's just part of my nature is to study that stuff my whole life. I, I've studied war my whole life and all this violence of art of violence. Um, you know, so of course that's, that's where I'm, what I'm doing. It, it leads me to help live a better life of service to people. You know, if, I, if I'm going to have some high end CEO sort of clients, these billionaire types are very, you know, prominent people, they need security and they would much rather have me around because I'm the, I'm the cool, like I got a fighter and a guy with a gun all in one. Um, they love that shit. They do. And if I'm out there holding them accountable, keeping them sober or whatever it is that I'm called to do for them. Um, I think it's I'm better suited with with uh, with a piece on you. Okay, question about okay. Yeah, I keep seeing with your hands or the different tattoos you got. I mean, t t tell me a little about some of those tattoos. What uh, what they're symbolic of? Or yeah. I'm just curious. So this is the good hand. Uh, I broke this in Brazil. I see. I had three surgeries. Yeah, I see a scar. Yeah, and, and the good the good finger. Um, oh, and, and yeah, it doesn't really close. Uh, I, I, when I fought Brad Pickett, it was like this, it was all, it was all infected. <laughs> I got to the, to Ireland and they, the Tony from the UFC pulls me aside. He goes, Hey mate, oh shit, that looks bad. What are we going to do? And I was like, you're going to have a doctor come drain it. I'm going to beat the shit out of him with it. We'll deal with uh, antibiotics and stuff later. Um, Cause it was clearly infected. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I, this, if you're Japanese, this means divine wind. If you are American, it means kamikaze. I want to have kamikaze on my hand because I crashed it into things for the greater good. Uh, and then I have here, so I have engage in combat, fully determined to die and you will survive. Go into battle thinking you will live and you will surely meet death. It's an old, another samurai quote. I have the bird on a reed uh, picture right here, which is Miyamoto Musashi, my favorite, everyone's favorite samurai. Uh, this is his, his favorite picture that he ever painted. Um, I have... The Lotus Club, Jiu Jitsu, Team Oyama, Colin, my old coach. We all got this set of tattoos. This stuff is all um, Shakespeare. My chest is Shakespeare. Like um, uh, violent delights have violent ends. I always drop people with my left, even though I never thought it was. It was the less powerful hand, but it was always like check hooks. Um, so yeah, these violent delights have violent ends. I have the um, family crest for Capulet right here. I have capital across my chest. I, I told you guys I was a dork. I was in drama from like middle school, high school, college. Um, I was I went to science camp. Like my brother would go do lifeguards, like junior lifeguards. You're at the beach all day, and I was doing science camp, like looking at fucking crustaceans and shit. So uh, you, you've been basically a nerd pretty much your entire life, though. So. I have one, I have Shakespeare tattoos. Um, okay, <laughs> yep. you know, and I have I have this right here, which needs to be finished. And it says it says war in Japanese, and has two big masks, and I have my whole leg sleeved with a snake and some war deities and yeah i'm um i'm so so when you say nerd is it just like like science stuff or you into like comic books and other things like that as well well i did comic books uh as a kid i did um my mom gave them all away which i had some really expensive shit in there yeah some of them nowadays are ridiculous uh, my my ex's son um he wanted them so i was like whatever to take them yeah like if, if, if you can figure out how to become rich with these have fun um you know like it's fine <laughs> yeah. uh, i don't get attached to much you know like whatever um but for me yeah, it's science it's more more about science and um 
you know, I've, I've become really, really spiritual over the last, you know, couple of years. Cause I healed myself physically. And when I'm, when I met that same scientist woman, um, I was, I was serving medicine. I was serving mushrooms and tea and, uh, my buddy would DJ, he'd play music and I would serve tea and we'd do some philosophizing and, and kind of like set intentions. And I'd talk to people, but I didn't have a process. I was just being kind of a party boy because we'd have, he would DJ and everyone would move around and dance and have fun. And some people would go super deep and we would just, there was no method, but I held space for people to make sure everybody was safe. Um, but that came with a lot of other party molecules and um, a lot of sex and you know when you have 30 beautiful women in the house and you're the one serving them high dose psychedelics they fall in love with you pretty easily and obviously you know i started to go down the path and i was like this doesn't feel right like this is everyone's consenting adults here but um i said this is the last ceremony i'm going to have because i know something's not right here that's when I met the scientist and she sits me down and she goes, you know what you're doing isn't right. Right. And I was like, Oh, you got me. Yes. So I stopped and she, you know, at 14 years old was in medical school and agricultural sciences school at the same time in Belgrade on the weekends, she'd run off to, to visit her shaman grandmother in the woods. She was like super diverse in the stuff that she understood. Oh writing papers on circadian rhythm and energetics. And like one of the smartest people I know, I, I, I saw her the other day. She's amazing. I love her to death. She's one of the smartest people I've ever on the planet. It's weird. Uh, and she just loved the shit out of me. So she, she brought me down this path of learning, especially during COVID. I, we, we live together. Um, what are you researching today? Let's talk about it. And basically like, you know, we go through the process of, of expanding my knowledge on breathwork, which is I was already working with Wim Hof and I had a good coach, but to understand the science of it, to understand all these things. And when you get deep and deep and deeper, you there always reaches spiritual enlightenment. And then you have to unpack it. Where for me, I was raised Catholic and I was like, fuck all that noise. You know, like the, the Catholic church did my family very dirty. So um, not happy with them. But it's undeniable there is some sort of source energy. Well, you don't have to call it God. I don't even like using the word God, or, you know, but um, there, there's there's something there. There's something that the, the intelligent design is what put this all together. This just didn't happen by chance. There's too many. The chances are, are way too astoundingly not in our favor to let this just happen. And um, I remember when my daughter, a few years ago, she goes, Daddy, I know you don't believe in God. Will you come to my to my baptism? And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't put your mother's word in my mouth. Um, I, I don't know. Of course I'll come, number one. Number two, why don't you and I figure out God our, 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 on our own? Let's just, we'll figure out a bunch of stuff. So I've been studying, one of my mentors from the actual 60s and 70s movement is uh, Robert Forte. He's a religious scholar who wrote books with Timothy Leary and Gordon Watson and Carl Rock. And these are the, these are the founders of psychedelics. And so I, I've had a deep view into Eastern philosophy, Buddhism, um, you know, Taoism, um, Confucianism, into Kundalini and all the yoga arts, you know, uh, Hinduism and, and Sikhism and, and these, all the Eastern philosophies. And then looking deeper into Christianity, my friend wrote a book called The Immortality Key, which was actually, it was expanded on from a book Robert wrote. And uh, it, it's called... Uh, the road to Eleusis. Eleusis was a place, still is a place in Greece where you can go um, and see the see the archaeological site. You're not supposed to say ruins because nothing's ruins. It's just old. Um, but the Immortality Key book actually spurred a new a new thing of study at Harvard. So this is like a real this these are this happened. Um, Christianity goes all the way back to that was one of the biggest pagan cults at the time when. Um, Western civilization was created by the Greeks, by the Rome, by, by the Greeks. Um, now it comes to find out they going to Eleusis, the Greeks were ingesting something with ergot fungus in it, which is LSD. It's the, the thing where you get LSD from, ergamine, ergot fungus. So they were having these visions, which would help them go from, you know, the, all the pagan cults that were happening at the time, create uh, Western civilization. And Christianity was adopted as the main one source. 
<clears throat> me as a paleo Christian pagan, I like to say when really people really want to analyze it and I want to have fun with them. Um, you know, I believe Jesus was a mushroom. You meet the body of Christ, you divine with God. Um, but we can unpack that later. Uh, that's just a lot of information. Um, <laughs> well, that, but we got to wrap it up here pretty quick. Okay. And it's got to, but yeah, to, but it's yeah. very interesting what you're saying. I, I would love to hear more of it. There's oh, def definitely would like to, you know, to back yeah. in with you at, at some point down the road yeah. there, just uh, you definitely a wealth of knowledge i i, yeah. I actually uh Ian, I, I don't get impressed by, by too many people but i'm impressed by your yeah. knowledge especially especially someone coming from the fighting realm here right now thinking i didn't think we'd be, be going this in depth of thinking gotta get this guy back again somewhere down the road yeah, like, we're speaking to some intellect that we could use a lot more intellect <laughs> in this in this world of ours yes very 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 much thank you for having me and then we'll we'll whenever you guys want i'll tune back in yeah, yeah, we'll and, make it happen again for sure. And, and just one last time, just 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 push if anyone wants to get in touch with you because they heard something that they they really like to join and they, they want to get back in touch with you. Go ahead and yeah, show yours. Ian McCall, I A N M C C A L L. Then there's athletesjourneyhome.com or org. I do believe we have both. Um, the McCall method, if you want to book me out, um, the McCall method.com. And yeah, I'm, I'm here to help you. And if, if you're looking for a source of coaching, uh, I can pair you up. Let's say if you're a woman looking for a female coach, I have a list, a giant group of people that I can, I can refer you to because not everyone's going to resonate with me. I, I don't, I, I have clients. I'll get more. I'll be fine. What we need to do is get people paired up with who they resonate, resonate with most. And uh, hopefully soon I will have, um, some of the world's greatest athletes at my disposal for, for them to coach you. That, that's, that's the plan. Thank you. Oh, hey, McCall, been better, just been a pleasure to get to know you. And, and I look forward to uh, yet another episode there uh, of a toxic masculinity to enlighten even more people. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. And I will bid you guys all adieu. Thank you for watching another episode of Dan and Don's Toxic Masculinity. You better like, subscribe, and share, or I'm going to come to your house.